within the whole thing of strength and conditioning, there's always going to be trends and new things popping up. Um, some stand the test of time, some kind of, you know, are scooted off to the back burner, but uh, we want to do a kind of piece called valuable or overrated. So the first topic is technology. Danny, valuable or overrated? Well, I think with where we're at now, it's on the coaching side, it's become a non-negotiable point where uh, it's, it's basically going to be expected to be implemented in some capacity, depending on what level you're working at. On the individual and kind of general population side, I think that it's on the good side, it's making things that matter important to people in a clever way. On the negative side, it's giving people um, some information that they really don't know how to interpret or process accordingly. So it can kind of start to work against you. You become fixated on things that don't really matter or mean much in, in either direction. So I think for the, the general sense, it's better than not to have something that had, keeps you interested or keeps you accountable or, or holds you uh, accountable to your training. And I think that for, again, largely speaking, like it's cool that people are getting interested in shit like HRV and REM sleep and bar velocity. So, you know, play with a few things as long as it doesn't become a compulsive attachment and it doesn't become something that you live and die by where if your whoop says that you're, you know, in the red today, then you can't do anything outside of taking a shit. Um, that, that it's just a little bit unnecessary. Still rely on intuition, still rely on, you know, for again, for the coaches, the observational piece and, and your coach's eye, but we're definitely going in the, in the right direction with it all. So you're going to have to jump on eventually at some point. In the, you know, collegiate setting and the professional setting, a lot of the issues that they run into is communication with the head coach and technology is a really good way to provide some actual data for these coaches to see what they're doing and that the programming is working and that they're seeing the results and it's not just, you know, wins and losses on the field or on the court and things like that, but, you know, are the athletes actually getting better? And I think data really drives that. And then for, you know, me personally, barbell velocity trackers can be difficult to use with the Olympic list. If you don't know how to set them up correctly and you don't understand um, how to adjust the software to certain things, because there's so much happening in an Olympic lift versus a strength lift. Um, but I've found a lot of success, um, especially with the VMAX pro shout out simply faster. Um, so close. you know, you gotta do what you gotta do. Um, but, uh, in using that to better understand, um, not only velocity, velocity, but bar path has been very helpful in helping me communicate with my athletes. So just telling them, Hey, we want to go faster on this portion of the lift. Um, than we are allows them to have some more tangible feedback. And rather than me being like, you're not going fast enough. And they're like, well, I, it feels fast. Yeah. The number one thing with the velocity piece is that it really drives the intent. Mm -hmm. And I think for whether you're just, again, you know, kind of an enthusiast or if you're, you know, certainly in the sports pop, uh, performance population, uh, you get competitive within your own training sets to try to hit certain velocities. So I think for, for that reason alone, velocity based training, I've found a lot of value with it. Um, the other thing that Nicole kind of alluded to is it can serve as an auto regulatory concept where, you know, you can, you can effectively assess your CNS readiness, your athletes readiness by doing something, you know, like a, a 50% clean pull or, or doing something even more uh, rudiment in like an RSI or a reactive strength index jump. So we, we, I think we're all kind of in agreement on that, that, you know, there's, there's certainly practicality and prudence to it. And, and when you, especially when you say technology as a whole, um, you know, but when it gets down to it, just make sure that you're using things in the appropriate capacities and, and directions. Sweet. All right. So the next one, uh, valuable or overrated uh, would be traditional barbell work. Um, I'm kind of in the middle, but if I had to choose, I think it would be a little overrated. Oh um, man, I thought I was gonna have a hot take. <laughs> <laughs> but I always say that, um, you know, in good taste, it just depends upon population. No, you can't. You can't make that statement and then cop out with that that <laughs> fucking <laughs> saggy ass answer. No, stand, overrated. Stand your ground. All right, so overrated. <laughs> <laughs> done. All right, we're done. Now. Um, but again, when I think of traditional barbell work, it's squat, bench, dead, power clean. Um, and a lot of the guys I work with sometimes cannot do it. So yeah. um, that's where I'm at right now. Uh, there's other, not to say that I'm not using a barbell at all. Um, you know, with these guys, I'm all about the landmine variations and stuff like that. Yeah. But yeah, the squat bench dead, all the big lifts. That's, that's actually what I was going to start out by saying <laughs> is, uh, you know, I, I, I was kind of 
firm on the overrated, but then I actually had an athlete point out to me not too long, like a week ago, um, when I was pitching about how overrated barbell work is, he looked over at the landmine in the middle of our set and was like, well, isn't this barbell? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I guess technically speaking, um, I'm still on the bus. However, uh, yeah, so like with exactly what you said, you know, I think that the, the ways in which barbell work has been associated or, or conducted in the past for a sports performance population, we have to talk about several variables point of development, you know, deficiencies and in, in individual abilities and, and so on and so forth. Um, I think outside of the sports performance population, most people probably shouldn't do as much barbell work as they do. It just, it, it constrains you to fix paths of motion. There's not a lot of opportunity to leverage your body around the barbell and still be in an effective or a stable position. And what's the outcome? What's the ultimate measure of this? If you're somebody who just gets the fuck after it in the gym and you're a four, five, six lifter and you train really hard and consistently, um, irrespective of age or, or background, then great. Like you've, you've done what you need to do to earn the ability to, to train that way. But most people really don't reach those kind of numbers in the general realm. So again, it's not an indictment, keep it in the mix and, and you can utilize, you know, certain things in the right times and capacities or frequencies and you won't have any problems. Just one I certainly wouldn't live and die by. Well, how do you feel? I respect you, gentlemen. I disagree. <laughs> Shocker. Barbell work is valuable. However, barbell work is valuable in my population because Olympic weightlifters only compete with a barbell. You have to train with a barbell every single day. Now, that's not to say that we don't do other things with kidding. dumbbells, with kettlebells, with bands, with the landmines. Serious question, though. Would you say that ECG as a collective whole is probably almost more radicalized in, in exercise selection than most conventional weightlifting teams. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would say I think Phil was kind of a major trendsetter with yeah. his whole rehab. Yeah, you know. Absolutely. Um, we're not, I would be, it would be selfish of me to say that we're the only ones because I do know of some other clubs that are um, follow along our ideologies and ideas um, and things like that. Um, James Tatum down in um, South Carolina, um, he's actually one of our East Coast World affiliates. Um, but he owns House of Weightlifting, and he actually wrote a really good book on uh, GPP for weightlifters. So, you know, we're not alone, but we're certainly one of the more, not the majority. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we do. We have a ton of exercise variety. We emphasize uh, warm up and movement prep, and a lot of that is done without a barbell or even with a training bar, just to give it some variety. But majority of it is with med balls and bands and dumbbells and even body weight stuff. And then- um, yeah, what, have you, what have you noticed, like since you guys have made that big switch? Uh, fewer injuries um, and fewer chronic injuries, I would say. Um, athletes are able to, um, are able to continue training through any injuries that they may have, but we're seeing a lot less like chronic um, tendonitis and bursitis and all of those things because we're able to provide them with things to keep their body fresh and robust and feel strong overall. And we're also not limiting them in the fact that, well, tough shit, you have to train today. So here's a barbell. It's like, Hey, you have to train today, but let's do X, Y, and Z instead of ABC because you are dealing with something and we need to continue to progress and get better. I would imagine too, and it, it, it would be difficult to retroactively test this, but I would imagine that people are getting through their programs more precisely as in able to do the percentages that were projected mm -hmm. with a higher consistency oh, than yeah. prior to. Absolutely. Because again, it comes, that's what it comes back to is like the overload syndrome is overload syndrome. It's a very simple concept to understand whether you swing hammers and, and turn wrenches all day for a living, or you bang weights and, and compete in the Olympics, doing the same shit over and over and over again in the same ways is going to create problems. Inevitably, it's going to happen. So by breaking up the barbell work with more variability and equipment modalities, you're able to effectively be better with the barbell in your hand. And that's been our, I mean, that is the entire premise of Rude Rock. Um, you know, nobody's trying to attack people who lift hard, train hard, and use certain equipment, but, you know, you got to be realistic and, and pragmatic about it. Sweet. Good segue into the last one. Shout out to Olympic <laughs> weightlifters. Um, so the last one, again, valuable or overrated? Recovery? You're so sorry. Ooh, overrated. About three minutes. <laughs> no, uh, valuable. More valuable probably than 
well, I don't want to start to stir people up, but more valuable some in some ways than the actual training itself. Because if you're not recovering after your training, then the following day, the next training day, and after that, and after that, are just going to be compounded, and they're just going to turn to shit. You have to recover whether you want to or not. I think a big block, obviously, that's you know, recovery is as valuable as any piece of the, of the entire puzzle. But I think a part of the uh, resistance to recovery modalities, or or you know partaking in some of these different modalities that are non-training specific is because people have the poor perception or connotation of training as being punishment. And when recovery enhances how you feel, it almost creates this psychological duality of, you know, well, I'm kind of supposed to be killing myself in the gym and I, you know, I feel good enough to train, so I don't need to do anything extra. It like, th that is just so far misguided and it's going to run you rampant and you're really going to run into a, a hard cap on how much progression you can make. So the whole concept of the recovery piece is to uplift the training piece. Your recovery isn't to recover from the workout that you just put yourself through as much as it is putting you in a better position to take the next workout up a little bit higher, right? It always boils down to equilibrium. And if we train hard, we create a disruption or a change in all of these different biological, physiological things. So we need to do something to reverse that back in order to ultimately take our equilibrium up over time. And that's really all it boils down to. So if you're pragmatic, then you value recovery. And I think too, like recovery can mean so many different things. Right. Like, I, I think we're all in agreement, like foam rolling, like- Overrated. Yeah, yeah. Overrated. And, and, and like, and you can take the, the same argument to a lot of different things. Right. While they're still valuable, massage guns right now are blatantly overrated because they're trendy, they're cool, you're you're exclusive if you bust your Theragun in, in Gold's Gym or whatever, right? So that's kind of what, you know, is another point that we need to be clear on is there are certain elements to the recovery model that are profoundly overrated. Right. Because yeah. I mean, like, there's a mental recovery, which I bet you no one really kind right. of takes advantage of. Versus, I mean, you know, massage therapy could be recovery. Yeah. Um, just getting normal tech boots. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, highly valuable. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And find what works for you. Uh, we have another video that we did somewhat not too long ago um, on navigating the recovery gauntlet, right? And that is just kind of a 101 of like, is this good or is this shit? Is this for me or is it not? You know, certain things work for certain people. There's nothing wrong with that. Right. But and, and just like your training, you got to find out what you have to prioritize in terms of recovery. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's the point too. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Sweet. Sweet.